Well, if you're trying to convince me that I did something for myself to be mistreated, that, no. <laughs> We, we can't have a conversation about that because that's not true. You're making a choice to mistreat me. So last time we went really deep in talking about manipulation and how couples or people can manipulate you in your life and then how mm. to then set those boundaries. What I really want to talk about today is go really deep into the manipulation, very specifically gaslighting. Mm. Because I feel like at least for myself, um, I do I didn't realize I was being gaslit when I was younger in another relationship. And so I wonder how many people don't realize they're actually in a relationship where this is happening to them. And the reason why I want to start there is to kind of start to unravel some things and then go into once you recognize it, how to then act in accordance. Absolutely. Well, gaslighting is sneaky. It sneaks right up on you because you don't, like you said, you don't realize it's happening. But when you get to a space in your relationships where things are unhealthy and you're questioning yourself and you haven't done anything, that is a time to consider, is this gaslighting? Because there are so many times when we upset someone and they blame it on us. Or when we um, ask for something and they tell us they tell us our need is too big. When we are trying to express ourselves and they say, you didn't express yourself good enough. Mm -hmm. And these things can be really scary. And we think like, oh, my gosh, do I need to improve my communication. And when you're being gaslit, there's no better way to communicate. You could say it five different ways, a hundred different times. And this person will say to you, you're not being clear. You're not asking for what you want. And really what they're not saying is, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't have the capacity or I'm unwilling. And with gaslighting, I think the biggest challenge is you replay in your head all of the details of what was said, what you did, what the other person did, where you possibly made a mistake and you blame yourself and it's really not your fault and it's strategic behavior on the other person's end yeah wow thank you for breaking that down and you've done a post recently about this mm -hmm. and um i'd like to kind of go a little deeper on those points that you just mentioned and really start to break them apart and know when that is a true sign of it versus just a little let's say misstep in a relationship or you know communication issues mm -hmm. so number one you say you question your sanity mm -hmm. so how do you know then when you question your sanity, if it actually is gaslighting mm -hmm. or if it's like, oh, no, actually, the chemicals in my body were making me think, you know, having a response to something where actually it was over the top. Mm. It's always helpful if we have a good sounding board. And I'm not talking about people who will always agree with you, but perhaps a therapist, an elder, a parent, someone who will honestly let you know. Well, you were you were wrong in this situation or I, I, I see your perspective here. Someone who can be honest. But sometimes everyone can say to you, there's nothing wrong with what you did. And when you're still questioning yourself, like there must be because this other person is saying so. That's when you have to step in and say, OK, perhaps something else is happening here. Perhaps I'm not the person who is at fault because 10 people are saying, mm. no, I don't think this thing is your fault. So you have to believe your crew. That's great, because that then goes into the second one where it's like apologizing even when it's not your fault. And these, correct me if I'm wrong, with these tips that you found yourself doing when mm. you realized you were in a gaslighting relationship? Absolutely. The apologizing, it is a way to make the other person calm down to make them feel more at ease to disarm them or even to repair the situation so when you apologize and sometimes you don't even really mean it you're just using it as a peace offering like okay let's move past this maybe i was wrong even though i know i wasn't let's just move past this so things could be smooth again it is a betrayal of self because nothing has been improved but you have put out this sort of I want this to be better without the other person being accountable for their actions. Hmm. So how do you, in those moments, let's say you recognize this isn't my fault. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and you go to find yourself apologizing but you catch yourself because let's say they've just watched this episode and they heard you say that um what would you then say because part of me actually thinks well isn't that on you like isn't it my responsibility to, to not apologize when it's not my fault versus it's that person pressuring me like how do you know that that's the um, problem in the relationship versus your own problems like you said it's self betrayal well anytime you're trying to apologize to keep the peace that's not an authentic apology an authentic apology is i feel like i have truly wronged you mm. i apologize and i'm willing to change my behavior if you're just saying i'm sorry to say i'm sorry it's not very helpful it won't be useful in the future you'll constantly be apologizing because you don't even know when you're doing something wrong or what mm-hmm. is wrong um so you have to be able to apologize from a space of i really mean this and not this is the next step so we can just move on from this and forget about it i think sometimes with kids there has been this spirit of apologize to them mm-hmm. apologize to you know with parents apologize to your sister apologize to your brother and then the kids 5 minutes later they're doing the same thing because they don't mean it and do you find that in in a relationship where someone is gaslighting the other person will do that to you or is it the opposite they won't apologize both i think well they typically don't apologize because they don't believe it's their fault mm-hmm. they don't think they did anything it's on you when you bring a a situation to a person and then they pin the situation on you is not their fault i've certainly heard of someone you know perhaps going to their partner and saying hey the other night you were yelling at me please don't do that well you provoked me because you asked me a question that i don't like still not a reason to yell mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not a reason to yell i came to you with with this issue and now the conversation has switched to I provoked you and then it's like well I'm sorry for provoking you and and you've apologized and your whole issue has gone out the window so you can't even talk to them about being yelled at because it was your fault that that they yelled at you mm-hmm. and again even with kids you have to tell them that it's not okay for people to yell at you and if I do it I made a mistake and I I apologize it's not okay How much then cuz that's actually super interesting how much do we should we be looking into our history and our past and what we were taught and how our parents brought us up to be able to assess um our actions now mm. I think the biggest thing is changing your behavior now and then secondary you can look at the past and figure out why it happened but when you know something is a problem the business is doing something better today not going through this oh my gosh where did I learn That's great. Mm. That's a great piece of it. I'm so happy you know your origin story for this behavior. I need you to stop doing this thing today and figure out the story of why later. Because if we get into this mm. cycle of I can't do anything until I figure out why I'm doing it, we won't change our behavior. That may take time. But today what you need to do is, you know, maybe not blame things on people, mm. not yell at people, not um point fingers when you are responsible for something. And I think it's very hard to acknowledge that you're at fault for something. It doesn't feel good to be accountable. Mm-hmm. It's not my favorite thing, but it is a thing that I do because it is necessary and I normalize it. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. We're humans and I'm not supposed to be perfect. So if I yelled at you, if I was late to your party if whatever happened I apologize because you're right I'm wrong I'm not going to justify it mm. I'm not going to give you a reason as to why it's okay for me to do this thing to you it's completely okay to not be perfect I love that girl thank you for saying that um but then in those moments how do you know when um you you don't want to just keep saying oh yeah that was my fault okay that was me and cuz part of um i know that in your list that you've got on your you know instagram post is um almost always blaming yourself mm-hmm. so where's the difference or where's that fine line between taking the ownership and saying yeah this was my fault that's on me to then taking all the ownership and blame um in a relationship Well, we show up in most of our relationships as the same type of person. So, if you accept blame with your partner, you probably do it with your friends at mm-hmm. work and all these spaces. And it's important for us to notice a pattern. When we get into the spirit of always saying, "Okay, it was me," just to get out of 
having uncomfortable conversations or having to deal with something very challenging, we have to look at that behavior because everything is not your fault. Some things are, Mm -hmm. but everything is not especially in relationships. There are two people. That means that there's two sets of energy present. So what did I contribute? What did you contribute? Um, perhaps some things are on me. And sometimes this thing isn't on me, but it's important to think about your patterns in relationship. And if your pattern is to always say, okay, it was me. All right, I'm sorry. That's something that you may want to work on to be able to stand up for yourself and be assertive and say, I didn't do that. I did not do that. So let's say you're in that situation and you have the, you know, courage, because I think it is brave, especially if you're in a habit for so much of your life to be Mm -hmm. taking that on yourself. Mm -hmm. When you finally say, how do you do that um, where it's not accusatory necessarily to the other person? Because we all know that when someone comes at you like, hey, I didn't do this. This was you. Immediately you do put those defenses and those walls up. Arguing is a choice. Mm. Arguing is a choice. And when someone who I know, oh, I know it. I could feel it right now. I'm thinking of situations. (laughs) It's like, I know this wasn't me. I will not argue with you about something being my fault when it wasn't. I won't do it. Because the argument is really, you have to agree with me. And I disagree. Mm -hmm. I'm stating that now. And I don't care how many times we go back and forth. I'm not changing my mind on that. Mm -hmm because there are some things that I'm just not responsible for. And there are some things that I am responsible for. I'm I'm typically not responsible for any ways that I'm being mistreated by a person. So if you're trying to convince me that I did something for myself to be mistreated, no, (laughs) We, we can't have a conversation about that because that's not true. You're making a choice to mistreat me. It doesn't matter why, how, what happened. I can't think of a reason you could do it. Mm -hmm. There's no justifiable reason. So you can't convince me that I am causing harm to myself (laughs) in in a way from another person. That doesn't make sense to me. Ladies, ladies, ladies. I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dream, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. I love that, but so many people fall into that trap. So what is it that there, is it the, um, is it not having confidence in that area to then stand up for yourself? Like that's mm-hmm. so strong girl. And I assume it's not, a, you, you maybe, I mean, maybe this is a misassumption, but that you weren't always very strong and very upfront and very um, articulate and honest about your feelings or were you? To an extent. I mean, I, re- I remember the first time, well, the first time I ever remember being given the silent treatment um, by someone after not acknowledging that or not apologizing for something I didn't do. <laughs> they tried to say, like, you know, you're the reason I acted this way. And the way they acted was terrible. It was very volatile. And it was like, it was your fault. And I'm like, yes. no. No, I refused. And, you know, this person didn't talk to me for a year because I refused to apologize. And I said, I'm not apologizing for something I'm not responsible for. And when they bring it up to this day, I still state the truth. That was your fault. That was not on me. I didn't do anything wrong. And you cannot convince me that I did because you don't want to be accountable for the way you behave. I think you have to deal with yourself. Sometimes we do things that we're not proud of. 
And you have to deal with that. And when you deal with that, that helps you to do better in the future. But if you're ignoring it, that means that you continue to to mistreat people and to behave in ways that are unhealthy in your relationships. Mm -hmm. So I'm not helping you by saying, "Okay, well, maybe you didn't do it. No, I know what happened. There were witnesses (laughs) and you will not convince me otherwise. And there will not be an apology on my behalf. God damn. So how on earth do we help other people that may not have the confidence to say that? Because that is so powerful. Like I'm I'm feeling like even more like energetic just by you saying I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, I want to be a cheerleader. But like in those moments, right, let's say you're feeling insecure. You've been in a relationship for a while. Someone's been gaslighting you. You watch this episode. They hear everything you're saying. But mm-hmm. it is hard to then make that shift into mm-hmm. I'm going to now have the confidence to stand by this. How do you encourage people? What are the things that they can do in order to stand strong in that conviction? Mm -hmm. It takes practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that happened after many years of experiencing this. And I just got tired. I just got tired of it because I I knew it wasn't my fault, but I never had the courage before that moment Mm -hmm. to say that this is not my fault. Um. But it took it took years for me to get to that place with that person. And once I did it, it gave me the freedom to continue to do it Mm -hmm. because I don't like people to revise history. What do you mean by that? Make up things that aren't true. You know, this is what happened. It is like, oh, well, let's call these seven other people who were present to really verify that that's not what happened. And it does benefit you to say this is how that occurred, but that's not how it occurred. And I get that. Again, it's very hard to sit in the things that we do when we when we wrong people. I feel really bad about, you know, some of the the things that I've done. But I'm like, you know, I did do those. Mm. I remember um, someone was trying to call me out for saying something mean and they were trying to catch me off while like, well, you said this about them. And I was like, I did. (laughs) I did. And I stand by it. That was the truth. Mm. I wasn't making up anything. Mm. I did. And the person that was there and they're like, thank you for saying, yeah, I don't want to deny that. I did say that. I did. Because now we're talking about integrity. If I will be dishonest about what I actually said. Mm-hmm. And I don't want you to think of me as a liar. And I did say this mean thing, but I don't want to be, you know, mean and a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather just be mean. I don't want to be both. Because <laughs> also you can't change the past, right? And so ch- it's like if you did it, you did it. Yeah. But people are going to look at who you are now and say, OK, if she can own it, then it does show you character, right? Yeah. I'm like, I, you know, I I haven't always done the best things or said the right things or, you know, None of us have. Mm. And so, yeah, I own that. I Maybe I didn't say that properly or maybe, yeah, I said this thing like, oops, my bad. <laughs> you, you live and you learn. And I think we have to hold space to not be perfect and to acknowledge when we are harming other people. Mm, so true. Um, I just want to um, take back. You just said something that I really want to like kind of go deep on. So you said... I said, how did you get here? And you said, it took a long time for me to do it. And then that was the first time that you really said it out loud. And then that gives you the confidence and encouragement to then stick to it. What, um, over obviously years, you know, of practice and practice, what did that really look like? What, um, work, internal work did you really have to do in order for you to get to that point where you could have the courage to speak up and say that? Um, are there any key things in those years of work that you had to do that other people can take and try on themselves? One thing that happened was I got tired of having these conversations in my head about what I should have said. The Mm -hmm. should have said conversations like I should have said this. And when they said that, I should have said this. And what if I would have said and I'm I'm like, I have to start saying this stuff because my should have said conversations are so good. Where I really want to start, though, is when you say like the key, the two pillars of a successful relationship, a healthy relationship, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with a friend, a sibling, a parent, is boundaries and communication. And so where I'd love to start is talk to me about how we even acknowledge where we need those boundaries in the first place. Because I actually have a quote from you, which I just, I literally laughed out loud. We may not even know what we need, but we know what we don't like. 
And I was like, oh, that's so powerful. Take me a little deeper into that and how we can use that um, as our first stepping stone to acknowledging where we need a boundary. When we find ourselves ruminating, talking about those things that are troubling and problematic, that is an indicator that we are having an issue with something. Oftentimes we'll just ignore it like, oh, this person gets on my nerves. But why? Why do they get on your nerves? What's going on in this relationship that's causing you to have this response when you talk to this person, when you see a text message from this person, when you interact with them? Could it be that there is a boundary that could be set that would repair, enhance, or save the relationships? Lots of times it's a yes. And instead of advocating for what we need, what we want, or what we want less of, um, we kind of deal with it. And it's very frustrating to be in a situation where you don't feel like this person gets it or they're doing this thing that you really don't like. I think the number one way to know when you need a boundary is your feelings. Mm. How do you feel when something happens? When you say yes, do you later feel like, I'm always saying yes to them. Or do you feel resentful? Do you feel taken advantage of? Do you feel angry, upset, sad? Those are indicators that perhaps there is a boundary that is needed for you to um, feel really good in those relationships with people. That's fantastic. So what happens then if somebody comes to you and you start feeling these emotions, right? And you're like, Nedra told me, okay, this is where I need to set a boundary because I'm really feeling it. And you go to set a boundary and the person opposite either says you're being too sensitive or, you know, um, they almost put it on you. Like this is a you problem. How do you, how would you deal with that? Because I think that that's where it shuts a lot of people down, where they start to feel badly about themselves. It starts to become, you know, detrimental to their self-esteem. They don't want to have that conflict with that person. Um, and so you end up staying quiet. How do you progress? We have to learn how to recognize when we're being manipulated, when we're being taken advantage of. Lots of times people will use those tactics as a way to shut you up, right? Because they want to do something that you don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying this stuff as a way to say to you, be quiet, here's my boundary. They're giving you their boundary. Don't talk to me about this stuff. And so once you start to recognize the tactics that people will use to silence you, you can stand up for yourself better. I was just talking to a friend about a situation I had where someone was doing something really mean and they would gaslight me and they would say, well, I did it because you did this thing. And, you know, at the time I was really young and, and I never thought it was my fault. I would think, huh, there's really something wrong with this person. <laughs> like, this thing is clearly not my fault. Um, at that time, I was in a, in a position to get out of it, right? But as I've gotten older, I am very clear on when I'm being manipulated, when I'm being taken advantage of. I'm clear of the wording, you know, that people will use like you're being too sensitive. You're taking this too far. You're in your feelings. It's not that big of a deal. When I hear those things, I think it is that big of a deal. I'm talking about it. anything I talk about is a big deal. Um, so I feel something and you're being dismissive. So. The more you increase your language around what's happening in the situation, the better you will be at recognizing when someone is trying to set boundaries over your boundaries. They're really trying to say, hey, I don't want you to talk to me about this thing. And this is how I'm going to get you to stop. Mm. What do you mean increase your language? Can you give me an example? Developing your vocabulary. So knowing what it sounds like when someone is taking advantage of you by using certain phrases. Um, I would do it for you if you ask me or um, it seems like you have enough time to do it. Why don't you you can't do it on Saturday? You know, when they're trying to do these things that you're like, wow, like I feel really bad again for not doing it. And Although we don't like to take certain things as a complete statement, like, no, um, that doesn't work for me. This is not a good time. We really like to challenge that with people. It's not okay. 
Mm. It's not okay for us to do it to people and it's not okay for that to be done to us. So true. So now I want to ask what happens then if both of your boundaries now come into conflict? And I want to give a great example. I heard you say in an interview that you have a boundary where it's the last person to get out of bed has to make it. And I love that so much. And I was like, the, it was the perfect example because my husband and I used to argue about bloody making the bed. And I grew up making the bed. That was the first thing you did. And he grew up in a world where his parents didn't care if he made the bed or not. So for him, it actually is against his value system because he thinks of it as a waste of time. So now I think of it as this is my sanctuary. This is my peace. This is my place of, you know, calm. And his boundary is valuable, but it's completely against mine. So A, take me through, did you find that with your uh, partner? Um, And then B, what would you do in situations like that where both boundaries are valid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does sound like both boundaries are valid, but I would ask, especially in a marriage, um, do you want to be right or do you want to have a happy relationship? And there are some things where, yeah, maybe I don't like to make the bed, but if this is pleasing to my partner, can I do it as a show of I love you? Perhaps my love language is you making the bed. That is an act of service to me. Mm. Um, So I need you to make the bed. So perhaps positioning it in a different way, because sometimes people don't like the word boundary, right? So positioning it in a different way, like I really feel cared for when you make the bed because this is my sanctuary and my place of peace. And so it's really important to me to get into the bed and it's all nice and every, all the all the 100 pillows are there and then we knock them on the floor. Um, it just feels like a peaceful experience. And it would be, really be helpful if you supported me in doing this thing, you know, a few times a week or daily, whatever sort of rotation you want to do. But sometimes it's not about we're both right. Whose side do we choose? But we we're, we love each other. And this is not a boundary that's like life changing. Right. This isn't a boundary that we're in the relationship, but it's certainly an irritant. Right. Yes. So. Do you, do you want to get along or do you really want to stand on principle here? Yeah, God. So where is the line between you actually need to stay firm on this and if someone doesn't reciprocate, then it's a sign of disrespect versus, you know what? Okay, you've set the boundary, but you've heard the other person out and now you start to negotiate your boundary. Where is that fine line? Yeah, so here's a, and I talk about, it's a whole chapter on on this boundaries with yourself, because we can only ask people for so much, right? And once they repeatedly show that they will not honor the boundary, that's where you have to say, this is my boundary with this person around this thing. So if it is making the bed, you know, maybe my boundary is, you know, I will make my side if you want to do that. (laughs) Or, you know, I will make the bed or, you know, hey, I will make the bed, but I need assistance in this other area. Like there needs to be some other things that that you can do. You can't make a person respect your boundary. You can only make a request. So you can say this is what I need. I would really like, but you can't change another person's behavior and the best boundaries are the boundaries that we set with ourselves with Mm -hmm. other people because it's very hard to get people to do what you want them to do in all instances if you say you know hey we're going to a party don't get too drunk you can't make that person not have seven drinks you can say hey after after i see you have two drinks i'm leaving (laughs) <laughs> you can't make them manage their alcohol intake. It is their alcohol intake. You can have boundaries around how much you will assist them when they get drunk, um, how much you're willing to watch it, how much you're willing to, like you can have a lot of boundaries in a situation that you can't control. 
God, I love that so much because that was part of one of the questions that I had is that a lot of people think that is certain things aren't optional, right? Like, well, I can't say that to them. Well, I can't not do this. Well, it's my mom. I can't not speak to her. Um, and the truth is everything is a choice. And I've heard you say that of you are choosing to engage in that relationship. Um, how do we start to take ownership over that to empower ourselves? Um, going to the chapter that you just said about boundaries with ourselves, how do we actually do that? So one of the biggest challenges is our programming. We are taught to almost not have boundaries, right? It's mm-hmm. like, um, you know, I see it all the time with, with kids. I have, I have two. And when my daughter, my oldest daughter was really young, there was someone who said to her, hey, give me a hug. And, and I haven't seen you in a while. And she was like two or three. And she was like, I don't want to. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to. And the person kept trying. I was like, well, you know, she doesn't have to. And I kind of picked her up and moved her away. But I've, I've seen that play out where people are like, no, give that person a hug. You know, mm-hmm. do this thing that someone is requesting. Um, you don't know when you're full, keep eating, eat everything on your plate. So there are things that adults may do, you know, smile, be happy. You have to wear you know, like all of these things that really take us away from the ability to be assertive. I think we do have boundaries, but they've gone, um, unheard for so long that we start to think they're no longer important. And so it's not that, oh, my gosh, I don't have any boundaries. We typically do. It's about how do, how do we express those things that are inside? We don't express them because oftentimes we've been programmed not to have any boundaries. It's not OK. It's me. You can't tell people that you don't want to come to their party. You know, you have to like everyone. And, yeah. You know, that you're I'm going to be really mad if you don't call her on her birthday. Like all of these things that are done to make you feel like, you must say yes, you must do this thing, even if you don't want to. But there is a way to say no, or um, I won't be able to do that in a gentle way. I think it becomes aggressive when we are yelling, we are pushing people, we're using, you know, old situations and examples and, you know, we're name calling, we're starting an argument. That's when it becomes aggressive. And that typically happens when we feel like we've just been taken advantage of for so long that we just get to this point where it's like, "Ah, why are you always asking me to do stuff? And, you know, it comes out as this yelling fest instead of saying no. And no should be used consistently. Right. And when people keep asking you things, how do we have the conversation around I see that you're not understanding that it's a no for me. And so what I would like is for you to stop asking me about this thing. Mm. Yeah. What happens then when people still keep asking? Um, Does that come to sometimes you just have to cut people out of your life? Is that sometimes you just have to accept them how they are and they're going to continuously cross those boundaries and you have to deal with it and suck it up and be okay with it like what's the because I think of different scenarios right it's like there are certain people parents are harder siblings are harder to push back on um love you know partnerships husbands boyfriends you know wives whatever um that seems a lot harder and so I think a lot of people go to just then shutting down versus actually still working through it still pushing through it um, Mm -hmm. to find a conclusion because if you're in a let's say a marriage or a relationship where they have the boundary and they just keep pushing back if you accept it I can't see a world where that relationship lasts or am I just Mm -hmm. being naive you know you presented a few options can you just suck it up can you, you know, re- reestablish the boundary? Do you just say that's how that person is? Do you cut them off? Any of those can be true. And it's all based on your comfort level. Some people just won't cut people off that are unhealthy for them. And I don't want you to. I don't want you to do anything that is going to uh, be uncomfortable and difficult and maybe harm your life in doing. Even, you know, like sometimes people just don't feel like they can do that. Mm. And that's not anything that I would put. You have to, you you don't have to. I mean, it might be healthy for you, but you don't have to do it until you're ready to do it. 
because my readiness may be different from your readiness. I may choose not to be in a certain type of relationship with a person, but your tolerance of nonsense may be higher than mine. I can't determine that. I can't determine that. I think the challenge is having a one set rule about cutting people off. I do think we have to do what is best for us and what feels the most comfortable. There are situations where it may not be to your advantage to to have a relationship with a parent. But if you can't envision not having a relationship with a parent, I don't know if it's healthy for me to tell you, you got to cut them off. This is your life and you get to choose. All of this is a choice. That's why I say all of those things could be true because they are all choices. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out which choice you can live with. I will say that when I hear the word, how do I deal with blank? I often think about dealing with anything is a choice. So if you ever struggle with how do I deal with my mother? You don't have to. Dealing with anything is a choice. So you can choose not to, or you can con- you can choose to continue dealing with it. Um, and some things are just intolerable. And so cutting people off could be helpful. Also placing boundaries on ourselves. Again, you know, there are some people who may chronically complain about the same thing and you are emotionally drained by experiencing this. Guess what? You don't have to talk to that person every day. You don't have to talk to that person for two hours when you do talk to them. You can determine what works best for your energy. You can say, you know, I do like talking to this person. I do want this person in my life. You know, maybe I'll talk to them once a month for five minutes. Maybe that works. That could be your own boundary with this person. So you figure out what works for you instead of looking at what everybody, you know, what everybody says, like cut them off, do this. You may not be able to do that in some situations, but you might be able to put some boundaries around how you interact with the person. Now my conversations, when I tell people the story of something, it's like, this is what I said. And then this is what they said. Mm -hmm. It's not, I should have told them this, or I was thinking this. It's, Mm -hmm. this is what happened. And people are often shocked. It's like, you said that? I'm like, that's exactly what I said. Because people, I have found that we have a lot of internal dialogue and it takes years for us to get to the space of being able to externalize a lot of the things that we're thinking. And it does take practice that helps. Um, But really the biggest thing is doing it the first time. Mm. The first time you do it, there is a sense of relief that you feel for standing up for yourself. There's a sense of pride. How good does it feel to no longer be the victim? It feels amazing. I am getting better at getting to that point faster. Mm. I want to get there faster. That's my goal. Okay. I want to be there the first time. Yeah. (laughs) That's truly my goal. I want to get there the first time. (laughs) And so how are you doing that? (laughs) Practicing. Yeah. Practicing. When it, when it happens, just. Sometimes, even if I don't say it right away, I've gotten better with saying it soon after. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's progress. I'm not sitting with it for years. I'm not sitting with it for months and days and weeks. And I'm just like, okay, let me go ahead and say, let me just call them 10 minutes later and say this thing. And what I love about that as well is it's like you you don't really beat yourself up in the process, right? Because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I'm just trying to get better every day. It's not mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm, I have to be perfect or not, right? Because when you slip up once, at least for me, if I'm like, okay, don't do this. And then I slip up, I beat myself up. Mm-hmm. But if I just, if I don't tell myself, don't do it, but I'm just like, okay, take that timeline, right? Like you said, that would be two, three years. And now just do it in 10 minutes. You practice it enough where it then becomes more instinctual and it just becomes naturally part of your vocabulary, the way you show up every day. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite boundaries is standing up for myself. I want to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's being assertive. Yeah. It is knowing who I am, knowing my worth and valuing that over, um, over what people might think and, you know, people pleasing and that sort of thing. Like mm-hmm. if I need rest, I'd hate to overcommit myself. 
I have a headache at the end of the day. Now I'm, you know, I'm doing all of these things to recover mm -hmm. when I should have said no. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in your mind then between assertive and aggressive? Because I find that it's such a fine line and I worry that I spill over too much into aggressive. And the second you do, I think, it, um, especially if you're in a debate or a discussion, mm -hmm. um, I don't like to go over to aggressive because then I think people then dismiss your point. Mm -hmm. So some very clear signs of aggression is yelling, screaming, name calling, demeaning. Those are all aggressive. Um, typically body, sometimes body language, trying to, mm. you know, stand over someone, intimidate them. Those things can also be aggressive. Mm. Assertive is clearly stating what you want or need, being mindful of your tone mm. and trying to say it in the right setting. Hmm. Cause yeah, I try to be like, okay, don't, you know, be firm because mm. that's part of me. It's like, am I, I'm like, do I have the strength to say this out loud, right? Mm -hmm. Like the courage you build up. It's like, no, you know, you need to be assertive. You need to stand by what you believe in, everything that you're just saying. And then sometimes it comes out, I worry it comes out aggressive. But mm -hmm. I'm like, but I just said like, no, this is how it is. Like I try to be very succinct. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that kind of like slow crossover or even just if the person receiving it may perceive assertiveness for aggressiveness. So the perception is something we can't worry about. We can mm -hmm. be very assertive and say, hey, I'm not able to come to your party. No one has been harmed. There have not been any explicit exchanges. I can't come to your party. And someone could say that was very aggressive for you to tell me like that. So there are times when we're not being aggressive at all. We're just naming what we can, can't do, what we're willing or mm -hmm. unwilling to accept. And people will say, you are being aggressive. Um, there has been a lot of, you know, conversation, think, think pieces about women being perceived as aggressive simply for being assertive. Mm. And that is true. And black women being angry mm. by being by being assertive. And so I think it's so important to be aware of what the difference is. And I think with black women in particular, um, culturally, there is a way that we speak. You are a Greek woman. There is a way that you speak within your culture. And mm -hmm. for cultures outside of that, that might seem like they're yelling. And it's like, no, that's just how they talk. Or, you know, if I just say no, it's like, oh, she's aggressive. It's like, no, that's just how we speak. <laughs> yeah, it's so true because my husband, who is, um, you know, I come from a very good, a traditional Greek background. When he first met my family, he was like, everyone is so rude. I'm like, what? Yeah. My family is so... Loving. loving. I was like, what do you mean rude? Mm. He goes, people keep talking over each other. I'm like, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> and he's like, what? But his perception of it was that we were just being rude. Mm -hmm. But it's like, oh, if you, if you want to get a word in in a Greek family, you've got to have to step on each other's words. Otherwise, you'll never get a word in edgewise. Mm -hmm. But like, like you said, the, the difference in culture. So what do you, is it basically then that's just them? That's how they're going to perceive it. You need to be, you don't need to worry about other people. You just have to focus on whether you are being aggressive or assertive. That's some of it. But I think if you're talking about culture, some, some, some people are given a consequence for just mm. saying, well, I'm just being assertive, right. you know, in a corporate environment. It's like, hey, you can only be so assertive. You need a job. Mm. And so if that's just you being assertive, you may have to explain your behavior. You may have to be um, more considerate about how you say things. So there are times where, yeah, you, you don't want to overthink the perception, but you know, there are things that will cause you to say, you know, I need to because my livelihood is dependent on how this could be perceived. So it's really important to understand that it's excellent where you could just be authentic and speak your truth. But there are some environments where people are not able to do that. And we have to consider that as well. Yeah, God, that's so true. Um, I want to follow up on something where you just said is basically you can't ex you can't affect other people and how they behave. You can only affect how you behave and mm -hmm. how you show up in a relationship and how you interact with people. And you actually did a post about um, almost like taking ownership, like this is what you need to do. And all of them, there's seven of them, all of them start with stop doing X, Y, and Z. And I found that fascinating. One, because it means that we do all the things. So mm -hmm. where do we learn the behaviors that 
we then start and implement in a relationship that we got to the point where we have to stop it, if that made any sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read them off to you and I'd Ooh. love to go through them. Okay. Um, but again, it really hit me that every one of them starts with the word stop. Mm -hmm. So stop avoiding conflict. Mm -hmm. um, is that because we instinctually avoid conflict? Absolutely. And conflict is a growth tool, I think. Um, because we have these conversations that are necessary. Hopefully the relationship or the situation continues and we know better. Mm. How will you understand what temperature you and your husband would like your home at if there's no conflict about the thermostat? <laughs> so there are so many conversations we have to have that we just avoid. And so we'll, okay, I'll just leave it at 65. If you don't like 65, just say we need to meet in the middle and maybe do 70 if I like it at 75. Mm. So just having those conversations can be so helpful. So stop avoiding them because they can really put you in a space to feel more comfortable in the relationship. Mm. I love that. Um, okay. Number two, stop trying to win fights. Mm. Instead of focusing on communication, understanding, or resolution, we focus on who's right here. Mm -hmm. And really, we're both wrong. And what we need to do is probably a blend of both. Or maybe someone's idea is better than the other once we talk it through. But you don't need to win a fight. It's not a sport. Mm -hmm. It's not basketball. Nobody's getting a championship ring. But lots of people end up divorced. Lots of people end up um, without friendships, without relationships, because they are focused on winning the fight. And this is not a game. It is real life. And we have to treat that as a sacred practice. And we have to understand and we have to listen and, and resolve when we can. So why do we essentially want to win? Is it to protect our own egos? Yeah, it, it it feels good to be right. You know, I love saying I knew it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Don't you like to be right? Yeah. I knew they weren't going to be open when I came up here. <laughs> it just feels good. It could be about any old little thing, a big thing, whatever. It's like, you know, playing the lottery with life. I knew it. Yeah. It feels good. Um, okay, you got stop denying other people's feelings. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Again, do we do it because it's it? feels bad if you have to admit that you hurt somebody so it's easier to kind of dismiss it? We want people to feel how we feel. And when they don't feel like us, we want them to be able to justify how they feel and why, because we don't understand it, because that's now how I would feel in that situation. And we don't all have to experience the same things in the same way or mm -hmm. even different things in a way that you would experience them. And so it's unreasonable to think that we would have the same experience, even people who grew up in the same homes, you know, siblings. My understanding of this may be different than your understanding of this. And it doesn't mean that either of our understandings are wrong. It's just mm -hmm. how we understood things. And so often we want people to, well, your feelings are not, he was like this, this was, like, and it's like, Yo, can I just have my experience? It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like your experience. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We experience things differently based on personality or who we are, what's happened in life and tons of other things. So we don't have to have the same takeaway. I love that. And even kind of going, tying that with um, winning or losing, sometimes there is no right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, the state of being and when you're trying to either argue your position or like you shouldn't feel like that well now that doesn't help any situation mm -hmm. that doesn't help you guys as a mm -hmm. couple um and now it's just kind of almost like make like if someone was to say that to me i would just start to feel badly about myself mm -hmm. that um the way that i was seeing it was being judged yeah I think about the you know the the thermostat i tend to err on the side of please have it hot toasty 78, you know, like I love it. Um, but there is no right or wrong for a thermostat. <laughs> oh, right, 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 yeah. Who is the judge? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like, there's no rule, there's no law. And we're, we really argue about things that are preferences. Hmm. This is my preference for how we communicate. This is my preference for how we handle the bills. This is my preference for how we set the thermostat. There is no rule, but lots of things that we argue about. It is preference. It's not rules. It is place, places in our relationship where we need to communicate more. 
God, I, I've never thought about it as being preferences because when you put it like that, it's almost like that doesn't seem like an argument that would happen. Like if you sit down and go, what's your preference? Oh, what's my <laughs> preference? But like there's almost like, is there room for an argument? You're like, no, you're wrong. But, but your preference is wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I actually really like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder sometimes, I, going back to the preferences, I often think that many of the things that we follow are just preferences. Like when we say, is this right to do? It's like, it's your preference. Mm. So what is your preference here? Because these are not laws. These are things that we are just deciding for ourselves. Now, I can tell you my preference in this situation, but it might not match your preference. And it doesn't mean that your preference is wrong. But what other things can people do? So they're listening to this interview. They're like, oh my God, yes, I need to make this change. I really do need to let go of my, you know, maybe past beliefs or just the way I used to think. And I really want to cultivate this new way of thinking. What steps can they take in order to do that? So you said finding people. I think community is everything. And I freaking love that. And you know, that, that phrase, um, the five people you surround yourself with is how you think and, you know, uh, turn up every day. So what are the other things that maybe people can do to start cultivating that? Mm -hmm. Getting to know themselves better. When we tap into who we really are, it really shows us why we accept things and how we have allowed things to go on for so long. To, so getting to know yourself more. Journaling is a wonderful way to start to know more about yourself. Learning your triggers and coming up with ways to respond to those things. So when you are triggered by this person who um, violates a boundary or by a situation that um, you may see on TV. What do you do? How do you ground yourself in these moments of maybe not having support from other people or being taken aback by something that you see or some experience you have? How do you ground yourself? Um, and I just want to go back to community. I think being vulnerable with people is a real way to build that community because so often on Instagram, in the comment section, I see so many people experiencing the same thing and they say, you know, they may send me a message and say, I thought I was the only one. Yet there are thousands. There are thousands because we're not talking enough. We're not sharing our experiences enough. So we feel like I'm the only person with with this, you know, very random situation. And it's like, no, it's like all of us, all of us have the same situation and we just don't talk about it. So you can't even find community if you're not being honest about your story. Mm -hmm. If you're not being honest about what's going on, who you are, your, your, your background, that's how you find your people. You draw your people to you by being vulnerable. And that authenticity, people are like, oh my gosh, that's, that's my same thing. And it's like, yeah, look, we have the same thing. And that's how you build connection with people. And that's when you start to see Wow. OK, so you did it like that. Maybe I'll try it like that. And so you start to get some information about some of these things you're going through. And, you know, I there's so many spaces, you know, maybe online when the world was open. You know, there's groups and, and all sorts of things for us to be in community. And those are good things because we do need to be with people who experience things like us, who did not, who, you know, we need a variety of people in our lives. And so community is really, really important. I love that. Um, and you were actually saying something you were saying about um, in like the language you use with people and how you, you know, show up. And I pulled one of your posts that I really want to go deep into because this is something that I personally struggle with, which I notice a lot of people do, where they're not necessarily being clear about what that boundary is or about how someone else's boundary is affecting them. And this goes to the second part of communication. And so I pulled a couple of things that you put, sometimes the problem is, and I loved this post so much, and I'd love to go through a few of them, where you put, sometimes the problem is you allow them to vent without telling them you aren't prepared to listen. I was like, oh my God, that's so strong. So that goes back to, that's actually you problem, right? It's you mm -hmm. haven't told them that you're not prepared to listen. How on earth do you do that? Um, I can't talk right now. I'm on my way to work. I'm about to start my day. Oh. This is not a good time for me. 
Um, is this something we can talk about later? Wow, I thought I was just answering the phone and it was going to be very light, but this sounds like something that has a lot of detail and I actually was about to hop on a call. Um, I think there are many ways to say, I can't talk about this thing. It sounds really big. And this is not the best time for me to get into it because there are some people who will call and they're just like, this is the problem. And they just go. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in line getting a sub. <laughs> like I'm, not, I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> and it has to be okay for us to have some limits around when we're able to talk about certain topics. And I think People can understand that. We assume they can't, that whatever they want to talk about, we're their only person in the whole wide world. And if we don't talk about it while we're standing in line, they won't have anyone. Right. And that's typically not true. Because if I have a real problem, I have a few people, you know, maybe not a ton, but I have, I'm like, okay, she didn't answer. All right. She didn't answer. Okay. Got one. You know, <laughs> like, I found somebody. <laughs> got one now. Girl, you got a minute? All right. Here. <laughs> Um, and, and I think it's important to to ask people if they have the capacity, because sometimes people don't. I want to know if you're, you know, in a store and you can't talk about something with me. So let me know. And lots of times when I ask that question, I've had people say, well, let me give you a call back in 10 minutes when I get back to my car. Or let me give you a call back um, this evening when I'm not, you know, doing stuff with the kids. So they let me know when their energy will be available for me to really get into this issue. Because if it was a crisis, I think I would have called the police. So this is not, it's a life crisis, but it's not a crisis, mm -hmm. right? And so this is something I probably could either find someone else, maybe go journal about, schedule a, a therapy session and wait for that person to give me a call back so I can process that with them. Yeah, I love them. But I also heard you in an interview, which is exactly how I felt. So this is why I wanted to bring up, because you said a lot of people interpret setting boundaries as being mean. And so when I read that post, where it's like you allow others to vent without you saying, hey, right now I'm not prepared to listen. My fear is that people are like, yeah, but I need you now. Are you, just, are you not going to be here for me? Um, and so the fear of not being alike to so the fear of not feeling like I'm in fact it's not even that the fear of not feeling like I'm there for my friend mm -hmm. is also so um just overwhelming that even if I can't handle the emotion that's coming at me in that moment I do just suck it up and I don't know if that's actually a good thing to do um how do we overcome that thought of being a people pleaser always trying to be perfect always trying to be there for your friends or your partner or your parents when it ends up possibly being detrimental to you um because i'm really torn with that because i love my family and my friends and my partner more than you know life itself so i get torn between those things yeah you know, I, at the end of the day, we will always have ourselves. And then on top of that is everyone else. So the person that I have to please the most is me. It doesn't mean that what I need or what I want is more important than anyone else. But I certainly believe in self-care first because I cannot care for anyone or anything before I care for myself. And so with that in mind, um, as I am taking on, you know, more things, I have to think about, is this something that I really have the capacity to do? As I am listening more to people, I have to think, is my energy in a space to take this in? As, as I am offering more support, I have to think, can I really do this? Because we're not doing um, anyone a favor when we are depleted and still helping them. So often if I say no, it's in light of everything else that I have going on, things that I need to do for uh, my family that lives in my house, myself, and then I'm honoring outside requests. And people don't know what my calendar looks like, what my energy looks like, how, many, how much sleep I've had, how much water. They, they don't know these things. So as they're coming to me um, for help and, and, and with requests, uh, they don't have a background story. And so we don't have to take it personal, right? And say like, oh my gosh, this person should know that I can't. 
Well, they don't know because they don't know everything that's going on with you. And it's really our job to let them know that um, I really can't handle this thing right now in light of the other things that I have going on. Um, and there's no apology needed for that mm. because we don't have to apologize for, for having other things going on. There may be times when you're available to them and there may be times when you are not. This is, you know, this might be a not time. How do you avoid then apologizing? Because you're 100% right. It's like we do that a lot, right? We apologize for things because we want to be liked. Going back to people pleasing. How do you avoid that? Bite your tongue. <laughs> bite your tongue. <laughs> bite your tongue until you get good at when you find yourself like, I, uh, 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 yeah. <clears throat> just cough. Don't finish it. Don't finish the sentence because... There is nothing to apologize for. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to apologize for. People tell us, you know, I'm so shocked sometimes at how hard it is for us to set boundaries. And then I think about all of the boundaries that people set with me. Everybody has these boundaries, you know, and we're constantly respecting other people's boundaries. Our parents, you know, who were super afraid to set boundaries with, they've had so many boundaries. You know, I'm, I'm happy that it's my turn. I'm like, remember that curfew? Ha ha, I got a boundary for you, mom. You know, it's like we, we've had so many boundaries put on us by other people. It is okay for us to have a few. Girl, that hit me so hard. Like, that's so true. I mean, it's, it's so simple, but it really did. Like, the fact that we all live in boundaries. But then yet we're talking about how do we set boundaries? It's almost like the boundaries we are used to. Um, one of my favorite quotes is the David Foster Wallace quote where it's, I don't know if you've heard it, but there's a big fish swimming along and there's two little fish swimming by. And the big fish says to the little fish, what's up boys, how's the water? Little fish keeps swimming. One of the fish turns around and is like, what the hell is water? David Foster Wallace. The point being, when you're surrounded by something every day, you don't even question it to the point where you don't even realize it's true. And I liken that to the belief system, where the belief system that we have growing up, we don't realize is handed to us, is told to us by our teachers, our parents, the environment, the world, you know, the street we grew up in, all these things. And so it just, it never dawned on me that that's boundaries. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was so strong. Yeah, they're all around us. And here we are. We don't want to set our own personal yes. boundaries. And everyone we know has these personal brown boundaries. I mean, I, I grew up um, and I had a grandmother and there was, you know, certain furniture in her house you couldn't touch. You, this is the couch you do not sit on. Um, this is, you know, this is the table you do not touch. These place settings are not here for you to play, little girl. You know, it's like. This is just for decoration. Don't you touch that. You go in the kitchen at the table. That's where you eat. You know, so it was it was all of these things. And I was just like, OK, yes, grandma. You know, I wasn't like, oh, she has rules. for me. It <laughs> yeah. was like, no, she has rules for me. And what I love is I actually heard you even say it in an interview, like, and I never even asked my grandmother why she had the plastic on her sofa. It was just no. like, you don't ask. That's the boundary. And you just respect it. Yeah, you just go with it. It's like, okay, I don't know. I mean, once I became an adult and I have kids, I'm like, I see what <laughs> Plastic see everywhere. What <laughs> Plastic everywhere. And now I'm like, don't sit there. Don't sit there. This is where you eat. This is where I got all kind of boundaries now. But, um, and, my, and my kids have boundaries too. You know, mm. they, they want to dress a certain way. They want to listen to, you know, certain songs that are, you know, not my taste. But, hey, if you want to listen to that, you know, it's it's appropriate. I don't like it, but go ahead. You know, so we we all have these things about us. And I think the more they're respected, the more we feel connected. Mm. I never questioned mm. my grandmother's boundaries because I knew she loved me. And if she had a room, who cared? You know, like, I, I don't even care because this woman is about to feed me some good food and kiss on me. And, you know, so I don't care about play. I won't sit there. You know, I didn't, even, I didn't even think to question it because I knew she loved me and we were so deeply connected that 
I didn't even think about these things. You know, it's like, I want to be in relationship with you. And if being in this relationship with you means that I have to take my shoes off or I need to call you before nine o'clock or, you know, uh, you want a heads up if I want to talk about something deep. Okay. Because I love you so much. It doesn't even matter to me. God, I love that so much. You just really hit the nail on the head of what this whole thing is about, is that literally by setting boundaries is actually creating a better relationship, a more connected relationship with that person. And so if we can shift our perspective instead of being like, I'm fearful of setting a boundary, am I going to cause conflict? I don't necessarily have the confidence. If we can just repeat to ourselves, it's actually going to bring us close. It's actually going to make us tighter. Like, I actually think that that's a great strategy of removing the fear that people may have of setting the boundary in the first place but the one thing that I do wonder though is sometimes when you set boundaries and you have people around you that respect them right you've communicated the boundary um you think that you're they're on board everyone understands and over time it starts to wean a bit and it's almost like your boundary has an expiration date um how do you deal with those things because those actually to me feel exhausting it's because you feel like, am I just like beating a dead horse? Does, is this a show of disrespect because I've told them in the past? Um, mm-hmm. how do you, how would you advise to deal with boundaries that may feel like, um, they, they have an expiration date? So one thing you could do is certainly restate the boundary. And when you get to the point of, wow, um, I've said this like seven times, um, maybe you want to say something a little more definite. And, you know, sometimes people keep asking because they really want to to um, break through the boundary and get you to eventually say yes or even forget about it. So it's like, okay, it's been two months. I've been doing this thing. Now I'll quit, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's not really anything personal to you. That's just how we do things. We exercise for 10 days straight, then we quit, right? It's, It's not anything personal to Lisa. It's just something that people do. Um, because really sticking to it takes discipline and it's not their thing. It's your thing. They're not doing their thing. And so it's, it's hard being disciplined with our own stuff, right? With the things that we actually want to do. I want to wake up at 5 a.m. I want to read two books a week. I want all of this stuff. That is hard to be disciplined. Add on to it somebody else's stuff. Like now they want you to do X, Y. It's like, I forgot. Like, I don't, I, mm. I did it five times. I forgot this one time. Um, as we're introducing our boundaries to people, cut them some slack for being beginners at understanding this, unless you think that they are maliciously trying not to listen to your boundary. But sometimes people truly, they forget. Um, is not at the top of mind because it's not their thing. We all struggle with discipline. Like there are lots of reasons that people aren't going to consistently be on top of your boundary. And it takes some level of training people to get them to really consistently get it. Gosh, I love that so much because I it was the initial feeling is always it's personal, right? It's against me. It's they don't respect me. Um, so talk to me then about... Um, codependency on setting boundaries and how that really does affect a relationship or really how like boundaries are the healthy thing to avoid codependency yeah so in code codependent relationships there typically aren't any boundaries Mm -hmm. um because the relationship is dependent on the enmeshment the rescuing the saving Um, Mm -hmm. the minimizing of really big problems. And so when you're engaged in those behaviors, there's typically not a lot of room for structure and limitations and expectations. And so having boundaries certainly breaks up the ability for a person to be codependent. Mm -hmm. And particularly when we have a family history of trauma and dysfunction, codependency, it's really hard to begin to set those boundaries because it's a new concept. They're Mm -hmm. like, whoa, wait a minute. You're the only person who's saying we have to do X (laughs) because the the family uh, dynamic has operated on 
not having any boundaries, not having any rules or expectations, holding people accountable. And so in those instances, I have found it the hardest with people who have those dysfunctional backgrounds um, with family because it's not a supported concept. And so often, like we started um, with you saying that people are gaslighting you and making you feel like, why are you saying this to me? That is often the case because no one supports um, this concept of boundaries. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. If it feels good, if it is a healthy concept, um, I don't know if it has to be supported with people that you're trying to um, implement it with. Hmm. Because there are times where people just, they won't support something healthy. And that doesn't mean that you're doing a bad thing. You know, if you're saying, hey, wash your hands when you come over my house. It doesn't mean that hand washing is bad if these people don't support it. It just means they won't support it. Continue your rule of hand washing. <laughs> so you don't have to take away these things because people are pushing back against them. You just have to build your strength and courage and consistently say, this is the thing I need you to do. And they may push back. And over time, they may, you know, well, let me wash my hands. I know you're going to say something about me washing my hands. Great. Excellent. I love it when you know I'm going to say something and you just do it. Wonderful. <laughs> That's so perfect because you know that they're saying that to be kind of like jabby, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I love that so much um, girl I'm so excited about your book Set Boundaries and Find Peace and what is one big key thing I mean you've spoken about so much in this discussion so it's just so freaking amazing but what's like one key thing for people who are listening or watching right now that you feel like they can start immediately and they can take away from your book Immediately is understanding that we live in a world with boundaries and it is your right to have them too. I hope that is the immediate takeaway. As you're reading the book, I hope you connect with the stories in the book around how our history, how our narratives, our interactions with other people really impact our ability to have boundaries. But even with all of that history that we have, we can still set them. Setting them is not easy. That's why it's a whole book on how to do it, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to think like, oh, it's easier said than done. No, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easier said than done, but it is possible. It is absolutely possible. And I assure you, you already have some boundaries. Mm -hmm. It may just be some small ones that you don't even consider boundaries, but you already have some and people are respecting them. How do you increase the boundaries that you already have? How do you develop new boundaries? How do you take those relationships that are really um, trouble and put boundaries into those? But we already have some boundaries. So we just need to learn how to execute boundaries in these situations where we feel disempowered. And from the book, I hope that people learn how to exercise their choices and speak about boundaries. So instead of going in with a curiosity, we go in with a conclusion. Ooh. So I need to slow down the story that's happening. This supercomputer is amazing, but it's also extremely dangerous because it is creating a story at a rate that is unbelievable. 